You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Hi, and welcome to The Blackest Questions. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Greer, politics editor at The Griot and associate professor of political science at Fordham University. In this podcast, we ask our guests five of The Blackest Questions so we can learn a little bit more about them and have some fun while we're doing it. We're also going to learn a lot about Black history, past and present. So here's how this works. We've got five rounds of questions about us, Black history, the entire diaspora, current events, you name it. And with each round, the questions get a little tougher, and the guest has 10 seconds to get it right. If they answer the question correctly, they'll receive one symbolic black fist and hear this. And if they get it wrong, they'll hear this. But we still love them anyway. And after the five questions, there'll be a black bonus round at the end just for fun. I like to call it Black Lightning. Our guest for this episode is Soledad O'Brien. Soledad is an Emmy Award winning journalist who's anchored news programs on CNN, MSNBC, NBC, PBS, and has hosted several projects with outlets like Fox, A&E, Al Jazeera, and HBO's Real Sports with Brian Gumbel. She's also an author, executive producer, documentarian, and the owner of her own media company, Soledad O'Brien Productions, which is releasing a highly anticipated documentary about civil rights giant, Rosa Parks. And we'll hear a lot more about that project during this conversation. Soledad is also known for sharing her informed opinions with her more than 1 million Twitter followers and in op-eds with the New York Times and Huffington Post. Hello, Soledad. Thank you so much for joining The Blackest Hi, Questions. Hi, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Oh, you have no idea how excited I am. You know, I look to you every morning when I, you know, I check my Twitter, you know, I read the New York Times, I play my Wordle, you know, I do my quick little uh, Times crossword puzzle. And then I log on Twitter just to make sure the world isn't on fire. But I love the way you have been holding journalists accountable for either headlines or just misleading conversations or just straight up lazy journalism. Mm -hmm. And I love when you're like, hey, journalism students, you know, as an educator, I so appreciate that. You're like, hey, students, Here's what we're not going to do today. And you just walk us through it as though we're in, you know, a a journalism course with you, this (laughs) award-winning journalist. And I so appreciate you using Twitter as a way. And then like, sometimes it is a little sister girl, like, listen, I'm not here for it. But I really, really appreciate you holding the discourse to such a level that is so needed right now. I so appreciate that. Every so often I'll get a note from someone who says, I'm not a journalism student, but I appreciate understanding how it works. And I'm like, yeah, it's for everyone. But, you know, there's so much, as you know, like inside baseball when it comes to how the sausage is made that I, mm-hmm. I think it's helpful to, for people to understand like why things happen, how gatekeepers really allow certain things to go through, why certain points of view kind of are elevated and when, mm-hmm. why others sort of disappear. I mean, there's a real process. It's not always intentional. Sometimes it's unintentional, but there's a real process. And so Thinking about what, why the media does what the media does is always pretty interesting to me. And then being able to share it, I think, is a kind of a good use of, of Twitter. Absolutely. Now, are you feeling, let me not, ha- no, let me not ask a leading question as I pay attention to Soledad on Twitter, but how are you feeling about the state of journalists and journalism right now? Not great, not great. Not great. Um, because I see us make the same mistakes over and over and over again, mm. right? I think mm-hmm. asking uh, candidates, you know, consistently, you know, so you don't think President Biden is duly elected, right? But while you're actually literally giving them a platform, and then they go on to the next platform where the reporter asks the same questions, it seems kind of silly to me, like a booker could ask that question. Mm -hmm. A booker Mm -hmm. could say, before we book you, here's what we need to know. Um, You know, and so I I think that's a problem. I think um, platforming people who lie Mm -hmm. is problematic. I, I think using um, unnamed sources, anonymous sources uh, at a time when it would be important to reveal those sources. Sometimes mm-hmm. it seems like people get anonymity just for any old reason at all, which is not the way it used to be. And also sometimes it's like you actually don't deserve anonymity just so you can bash someone. It seems unfair to the person whom you're bashing. So yeah. there are lots of things that I see repeated over and over and over again, which makes me feel a little bit um, a little hopeless about the situation at times, but maybe slowly we're, we're going to learn and maybe we only learn you know, over time, it's one of the reasons I try to name people and call them out specifically, because Mm -hmm. sometimes I think specific people need to understand specifically what they specifically are doing, uh, Mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, generally speaking, you should do better at this. It's like, no, you failed in this this moment. Right. Right. And here it is. Um, You know, let's talk about that specific thing. My frustration has been the lack of follow-up questions, where it seems as though someone says something 
wild. I mean, either it's a flat out lie or if it's, it, it's just egregious histrionic, you name it. And then it seems as though the journalist is like, okay, well, well next question. I'm like, no, 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 I'm sitting at home. I want you to follow up with a question, making them justify, where did you get this? Random? You know, I, I see a lot of Republicans love a statistic, but they're like empty statistics. You know, it's like 30% of, you know, black people kill one another. And I'm like, where, where is this from? Why are you saying it for what? Well, a good end? example today would be a, a good example would be uh, Herschel Walker, right? Saying it's a real mm-hmm. badge when any human being would say it's not a real badge. It's physically a tangible physical item. But that is not the equivalent to someone who's been to a police academy. So when you say real, you're trying to imply that you're really a cop. You are not. That is a lie. I am work with many police officers. <laughs> and at the same time, Mr. Pastor, Walker, you have a prop. Yes. That is not allowed, sir. Yes. I ask you to put that prop away. Well, it's not a prop. It, it, this is real. And he said, I but, have a prop. I never worked with law enforcement. A prop, Mr. Walker. Like, right. that is how I would have asked that question. I would have just said, when you tell people or you imply that you're a cop, it's a lie. Mm-hmm. And said, you know, people let him say, well, it's real. It's a real badge. I mean, I have one of those to anybody who's covered. I mean, I can go to Party City and get a real badge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I got mine for covering Hurricane Katrina. You know, I'm not allowed to arrest anybody. I certainly, you know, wouldn't take it out in a traffic stop and hope that I get some leniency. It's ridiculous. But a lot of, again, that's a, a conversation that's elevated as if it's mm-hmm. serious. And it goes mm-hmm. down a path as if it's serious when the person could say, if that were your child, you'd say, let's stop because that is a lie. And what we're not going to do on my show is let you lie. We're not lying on my show. Soledad, are you ready to play the Blackest Questions? I am ready. I'm very excited, but I'm bad at questions. You know, do you ever see me on Jeopardy? I was on Jeopardy once. Oh, really? Oh, okay. No, we've got oh, really. to pull up We're the like, clip. Oh, really? Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was sad. But you know where I was very strong? Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> that was oh. my category. Okay. I was quite... Good at Jennifer Anderson. Everything else, not good. I think I just get in the moment, I get a little panicky. Same here. And you know, my my Grio sibling, uh, Panama, uh, had me on his Dear Culture podcast, and I did not do well. We we did like a a, a Jetsons Flintstone reversal, and you know, I understand now. I have a lot more um, empathy for my guests on the show. <laughs> good to okay. know you're empathetic. <laughs> yeah, I am. So, question number one: the blackest questions. This Harvard University graduate is known as the father of Black history because he started Negro History Week and later evolved into Black History Month. Who was he? Uh, I have no idea. It's Carter G. Woodson. Oh. So in 1926, Woodson pioneered Negro History Week and he selected the second week of February to coincide with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Woodson said his goal was not to emphasize Negro history, but the Negro in history. Kent State University expanded the idea into a full month later in 1970. And since 1976, every U.S. president has designated February as Black History Month. Carter G. Woodson was the son of former enslaved people and was born in Virginia. He was a historian, author, journalist, and professor. He was only the second Black man to receive a PhD from Harvard University in 1912. And he's one of the first scholars to study the history of the African diaspora. Oh, wow. And you said Kent State was the, the university that expanded it? That, that expanded the idea until a full month wow. in 1970. Okay. And so I know that you're a, a Harvard grad. And I know. So, a Harvard grad, Black History Month. <laughs> You know, as I but, said, I feel like I said going in, not my strength, but that's great to know. Well, and, and as I remind all of our listeners every week, the point of this podcast is for us to A, get to know our guests, but B, Black history is American history. And so if you didn't know, I'm sure there are lots of people who are listening to this podcast who didn't, but we should all know who Carter G. Woodson is, not just Black folks, but everyone who lives in this country who appreciates the, the hard work that people have put in uh, to this nation should know who Carter G. Woodson was. And, and so- C, And C, be able to mock your guests for not knowing something that they should know. Carry on. I'm ready. What's the next well, one? I'm, I'm quickly better. making uh, uh, notes on how do I incorporate Jennifer Aniston? And so- <laughs> <laughs> My strength. It's my strength. <laughs> Witty. Honest, entertaining. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the Black culture debates you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. So, in the spirit though of Carter G. Woodson and creating this this Black History Month, where we learn a lot more about our history, um, and lots of people want to, you know, 
write articles about him and, and not just historians, but journalists also. Um, what do you think makes the best type of journalist? Like, is it, you know, I've heard different debates. Is it a historian that really makes a great journalist? Is it a political scientist? What kind of foundation do you think we need academically to really, you know, do the hard hitting journalism that, that you, you know, you talk about on Twitter and that we just, we talked about a few minutes ago. I would say a curious person who Mm. is willing to understand, like, this is where I need a historian, or this is where I need a political scientist, or this is where I need a data scientist, or, you know, here's where I need a psychologist, you know, because to me, really good journalism is about trying to understand people and then really serve your audience, right, with the goal to say, I want to explain this thing to an audience. One of the Mm. things I have found really sorely lacking is, well, maybe two things. One, politics as a game. Like, there's no... There's no people attached to the polls. So the reporters get a very sassy tone. It's about zingers. Who's about who's winning? It's not about, you know, here's what these people represent. Let's help you make good decisions as you think about going to the polls one day soon. So that's part of it. And then I also think they don't think about serving the audience. Like, who's your audience and how do you help them understand something complicated? So often history is left out. A a good example are all the stories about anti-Semitic a rhetoric, right? They're not just in a vacuum. They, they're they part of a history, a really horrific history. So, you know, when someone says something anti-Semitic, it's not just, well, that person's a jerk or that person's wrong or they're mean. It's like, wow, they're trying to create a narrative that we know is a very scary narrative when mm-hmm. combined with other things, because there's a history that mm-hmm. connects to that. And also there's a present that's around violence and, um, and hostility, right? So things can't just live in a vacuum. So I always like reporters who are interested in data so that they're not just telling stories of the one, but stories that are backed up with some kind of data, and then also have a place in history and are willing to explain and understand help their audience understand what they're, what they're hearing. Yeah. I mean, when I talk to my students, I I really push them to go beyond this idea of red team and blue team. It seems as though, you know, oftentimes when they watch the news, it's like reds versus blues. And sometimes we've get purples. I'm like, no, no, these are real people actually behind that data as well. And so it's not just about moving around fun states to sort of tally up things. It's, it's policy positions that some people are really invested in. Some people are really invested in anti-Semitic and, and anti-Black and anti-immigrant policies, anti, anti-woman anti policies, anti lgbtq And why, plus. Right? And and why yeah. are they? What's the win? What's at stake? What are they doing it for? Mm-hmm. Historically, what has been the value of that? I mean, that to me is exactly right. It's not just, here's what happened. It's the context that helps people understand it, I think. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to take a, pre- a brief break and then come back and play a little bit more of The Blackest Questions with Soledad O'Brien. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Griot Mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. And we are back. Soledad, thanks so much for joining me on The Blackest Questions. You are most welcome. I'm ready. Okay, you're ready. I love it. Coming in hot. Okay, question number two. In 1868, this university was the first in the country to open a medical school that welcomed medical students of all races, genders, and social classes. What university was it? And here's a hint. It's an HBCU. I knew that. Uh, I'm going to go with... Xavier? Mm, that's oh, a Morehouse. solid guess, but it's Howard University. Oh, interesting. You know, so Xavier, how, I think, has the most graduates who yes, end up having do. medical degrees. So I thought that might be connected. They absolutely do. I mean, Xavier is producing more and more Black doctors every year. But it was Howard University that started clinical instruction, was offered for free, and a full course of classes for one year cost $135. And on the Mm. first day of classes, the school had eight students, 
seven black students and one white student. They had five faculty members and only one of them was black. And that man was Dr. Alexander Thomas Augusta, who's believed to be the first black man to serve on a medical school faculty in the US. And Dr. Augusta was born a free man in Norfolk, Virginia in 1825 and received his early education in Baltimore, which is, you know, our listeners know Baltimore is my absolute favorite city. <laughs> um, and so when you were first enrolled at Radcliffe College in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you majored in pre-med. And yeah. what initially drew you to medicine? And how did you pivot to journalism you know, from medicine? The, the truthful answer would be uh, as a child of immigrants, I think mm-hmm. it was like stamp of approval, right? It's a good, it's a good job. It's a serious, thoughtful job. Um, you know, I think my parents were always into like, what's a good job mm-hmm. to have a nice, secure, good job. And also I had no, I didn't know anybody in media, so I didn't know anything about it. I grew up in Long Island where, you know, the people in the community who were doing well were doctors. Doctors and lawyers were well-respected people. I took organic chemistry with my sister and, uh, it, it, you know, partly it just wasn't my thing, but also I just wasn't passionate about it. I mean, mm. you know, I can memorize a lot or now that I've had four kids, I can't remember anything. But before I had kids, I used to be able to um, to memorize a lot and I could kind of regurgitate, you know, mm-hmm formulas. But then what would happen was you realize like, but are you passionate about it? Do you, my sister was the one, she's a surgeon. And she said, you know, I just feel like you're memorizing stuff and you don't, you know, you should be able to deduce it. You should understand Mm -hmm. what that formula is. And it was really her comment that made me rethink the whole thing. We were taking organic chemistry together. And she would just say like, why do you, you should know the formula of a line is Y equals MX plus B because you have an X axis, a Y axis, a Mm -hmm. B is a variable. And like, you should understand how it all works versus I have memorized a bunch of stuff for this test and I can blah, 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 regurgitate it. And it was really interesting. I was like, yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm not, I mean, she was really, is really a scientist. Yeah. And so I, I, I left school. I started working. I got a job at a TV station um, and I loved it, but I was like fetching coffee and removing staples from walls and opening mail and answering, you know, but, but it was, I, I, I enjoyed it because I liked being around the news. I enjoyed mm-hmm. sort of all the things that we were doing. And I was, I was, you know, I was pretty good at like, I can answer a phone and open the mail and <laughs> can get you lunch with fries at the same time. But I, I also liked that at the end of the day, your story was done. And mm-hmm. I liked the idea of informing an audience and and being able to be a bit of a gatekeeper of like, okay, well, here's what I think the spin on this is. Here's how I would tell this story. So I really enjoyed that. So I, I kind of started moving up the ladder and left, um, you know, medical school behind. But I had been a candy striper. I'd worked in a farm, right? Doing my little uh, resume right. building from the, the time. road to medicine. Exactly. So that O'Brien, the road to medicine. And, you know, and then you realize like, it's not about the road to medicine. You should be passionate about mm-hmm. helping people and wanting to be a good scientist. And that wasn't me. So I, I much more preferred to be a reporter, went back to school eventually and finished my degree. Well, well, I mean, I think journalism in a lot of ways, you know, help communities in, in different ways, you know, not the, the same way surgeons do as well. Now, here's something going way back in the crates. Do you remember your first story that you ever Ugh. reported on? Gosh. When you decided to like make that commitment, like I'm going to be a journalist. Do you remember? Oh, but as a reporter story? or as a, because I worked as a long time as a producer, but my first reporting story, wow, that's a great question. I don't remember. I was working in San Francisco for KRON TV. I remember my third story because I was kind of, someone grabbed my butt on that story. <laughs> my first live shot is not good. Wait, you were constantly grabbing your, or someone was constantly someone grabbing Someone behind your butt. me. I was doing a live mm-hmm. shot my third day. And they promised that I wouldn't have to do a live shot for a couple of weeks because I was brand new. I'd never been on camera. I'd been a producer at NBC News. And so uh, so as I was doing a story on this, the San Francisco Giants making it into the playoffs, I'd set up my lights like TV lights. And I mm-hmm. didn't know, I didn't know the rules, right? You should never, ever, ever let people behind you where you can't keep an eye on them, you know? And so, which of course I didn't realize. So I'm doing my live shot. So at O'Brien standing by live. And all of a sudden, a guy behind me reached out and pinched me on the behind. Yeah, it was really awful. So it was bad. So I remember that one. That was my third day. So that uh-huh. was a, that was my third day, but I don't remember the first one. Do you remember the first one? No. No, but we're going to have to go through the crates and, and get and to San really Francisco. Should. I'm what sure was it the... was not good because my third one was quite terrible. Yeah, I, I love reporting. I love San Francisco. San Francisco is a great market for mm-hmm. interesting stories. Um, I, I really love San Francisco um, for storytelling, but I do yeah. not. 
But sadly, I think a lot of female journalists have uh, a version of that story at some point in their careers um, that yeah. you, you sort of power through. But at the same time, it's it's just no one should have to be in a workplace with. And you learn the rules, right? I mean, I'd mm-hmm. never, I had never, it had never occurred to me that I should like think about protecting myself when I'm sitting in right. a bar among drunk people <laughs> and report the story. Right. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a, a brief break and come back with Soledad O'Brien on The Blackest Question. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here. Everything you've been waiting for. Black culture amplified. Find your voice on the Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Griot Mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. And we're back and we're playing the Blackest Questions with Soledad O'Brien. Are you ready for question number three? I am so ready. I've not been off to a strong start, but I'm feeling very good. I feel like once we move out of the 1800s, I could get better. <laughs> I feel like the 1800s is not my strength. I'm going to add in some Jennifer Anderson questions and then we're just going <laughs> to knock it out. Or even part. just 19, anything past 1960 when I was around. You're like, can we get into the, at least the late 20th century? And then maybe <laughs> we can do some things. Okay, so I'm not sure about this one, but we'll see. Question number three. Known as the first lady of the Black press, this female journalist was the first Black woman to be included in the White House press corps, and she was notorious for asking questions about civil rights that angered President Eisenhower. Who was she? Who would that have been? You know, this needs to be multiple choice. And I, I'm sure half of our listeners are like, I have no idea. I don't know. Who is it? Ethel Payne. Oh, Ethel Payne was a civil rights journalist, and when CBS hired her in 1972, she became the first Black woman to be hired as a political commentator by a national network. She was born in Chicago in 1911, and her family only had enough money to send one of their six children to college, and Ethel was not one of the lucky ones. So instead, she made her own path. She got hired by a Chicago newspaper, the Chicago Defender. Defender. (laughs) <laughs> was made for African American readers and was instrumental in the Great Migration, which saw more than six million African Americans move from the rural part of the South to urban Northeast, Midwest, and Western parts of the United States. Ethel also worked in radio and covered events including the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement, and historical legal cases like Brown v. Board of Education. So, wow. had you ever heard of? I had not. Well, and what kind of threw me was Eisenhower, right? I was like, oh, I wonder where we're going. So no, that's so interesting. No, I had not. So tell us a little bit more. You know, we know that there, there's the importance of civil rights journalism. Talk to talk to us a little bit more about this documentary you've got coming out, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. I am so excited and so um, appreciative that you have put this together. You know, obviously I'm an educator, so I always think about what this means for my students, creating more of a foundation for them to understand not just Black history, but American history as well. So what our, what inspired you to, to work on this documentary? So really, our directors, uh, Yoruba Richin and uh, Johanna Hamilton are the two directors of this great project. And, and it really interestingly started when Johanna would uh, tweet See, look, Twitter being used for good. Really Johanna would tweet good. with a woman named Jean Theo Harris. She's a professor and she had done a biography of Rosa Parks. And I guess she'd get on Twitter and talk about all the things people didn't know about Rosa Parks. Mm-hmm. And I, I think Johanna was like, I didn't know this. I didn't know this. Eventually, Jean Theo Harris uh, wrote a, a great book by the same name, The um, Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. And uh, and Jean, uh, uh, Joanna and uh, Yoruba brought the project to us. So they're the ones who did all of the, the heavy lifting in this project along with our producers. But what I thought was so fascinating was I kind of went into the first meeting thinking like, yeah, I know a lot about Rosa Parks. Like what else is there to know? First, I didn't realize that no one had ever done a talk on Rosa Parks, like a full, I mean, which was, I, I actually didn't believe it. It's one of those things you're like, uh-huh, but I better fact check that. Right. Exactly. And then it's, like, it's, it, it's like, no, there, this seems a little too be true. convenient. Be true. Of course be there true. has to be one. Right. So that was the first surprise. And then I think what Yoruba and Johanna really brought was what was the dynamic story of a woman whose whose life story has been kind of whittled down to this moment in time, literally not getting up from her seat on a bus when actually what you learn about Rosa Parks was her long history. So much more. 
from the time she's a child, how she thinks about civil rights and justice in America and and how for decades she works. I mean, from, you know, whether well up to the bus boycott and well after the bus boycott. So there were so many things that uh, that I learned. And I think all of us thought this is going to be a great project because this book really lays out kind of all the things that we thought we knew about Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. But in fact, we do not know. And, And that made it very interesting for me. She was considered a threat. Espousing radical views. If they could see her talking about the Republic of New Africa, her out there with the Panthers, then they would understand the real world parts, but they might have been just a little frightened. Yeah, I'm so you know excited for folks to learn that, you know, as you said, we see her as this diminutive sort of older woman who refused to give up her seat, but you mean she was she was a really bold fighter, you know, going to places in the deep South that I don't know if you and I, you or I would have the guts to go to in the year 2022, going there as a black woman by herself, investigating rapes. I mean, really standing up for black women and black people in these really extraordinary times. And most people only know her as this kind of neat packaged grandma type figure, you know, and some people know the wrong story of like, oh, she was tired. And that's why she didn't give well, up her seat as was a real coordinated point. civil rights effort. Yeah. And the, the press very much um, loved that story. In fact, when she died, the New York Times described her as the accidental matriarch. And you're like, well, not accidental at all. Yeah, not at all. I mean, it's not an interesting all. way to frame someone's story when truly, uh, I don't know that there's a lot of civil rights legends who you could say, you know, from almost their moment of birth, were working very, very hard and often right. very uh, in very tough circumstances and, and sometimes very frustrated in their efforts to bring equality to Black Americans. So I, I thought it was fascinating, you know, and the other Rosa Parks at one point. You know, she's she, the story of that, the fact that she was tired was repeated over and over and over again. But the reality is, as she said, she was no more tired than she was on any work day. Mm-hmm. But actually what she was tired of, and she said it was Emmett Till's story that inspired her. What she was tired of was being treated badly. She mm. was tired of oppression, mm-hmm. you know, which, of course, that's a very different kind of tired. Right. And you can see journalists being like, oh, she was tired. Right. Long day, feet hurt, on a bus, doesn't want to give up her seat. And she's like, oh, no, no, I am, I'm bone tired of mm-hmm. this mess, and I refuse to take part anymore. So that was a really interesting perspective that I, I, I hadn't really understood that story. And the number of times that she tried to correct it, like really saying, I was no more tired than I was any other work day. This right. was a different kind of tired. And I think it kind of fell on deaf ears. People liked that narrative. And, and I'm always curious which we tried to explore in the doc, like why is the narrative of the the gentle, kind of weak, almost passive, mm-hmm. accidental civil rights hero, you know, why do we love that story? Why is that a better, more palatable take than here's a person who at the age of eight watched her grandfather basically sleep with his gun because he was worried about the Ku Klux Klan. And she grew up to literally have a massive distaste for white people to the point where she was just so angry about it. She didn't even want to date her husband because he was light-skinned and eventually he won her over. But this is a woman who equality and justice were part of her DNA from the get-go. Mm-hmm. She was nothing accidental about her at all. So we wanted to explore the, the facts of the case and then right. also to really dig into why was that something that was so palatable? Why does that make us comfortable when we hear stories that are just absolutely not true. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I love sort of this, this honesty because we, we have yet to have real honest conversations about so many figures in the civil rights movement. I mean, the strategies that were employed, you know, we know Miss Colvin was not chosen as sort of the face of the, the bus boycott. Because- Colvin, the first young woman, she was 15 at the time. Did you know that she was a mentee of Rosa Parks? Well, I didn't know she was a mentee. I know that, you know, she just wasn't uh, the ideal candidate for to be the poster child for this type of. Uh, I never ex- knew that exercise. the two of them not only knew each other, but they sort of worked and strategized together as mm. mentor mentee. But fascinating, right? It kind of changes Absolutely. for me. It changed my pers- pers- perception of sort of like, oh, so this is how people mm-hmm. thought about this. I mean, it's just absolutely fascinating when you start to understand some of the, the stories. And then, of course, there is a misogyny, like why were wit- women right. written out of the story of civil rights, you know, pretty much as a whole? Why did they not get to appear on the big stage? Why were their stories not considered as important or as centered as others? Why did Rosa Parks not make money? 
from the right. 10 zillion speeches that she did and appearances that she did and honorary awards that she won and the travel that she did. She literally, we have a, a, a um, her her tax documents one year, she and her husband made 700, a little under $700. I mean, it's craziness. So mm-hmm. those to me were the much more interesting stories about Rosa Parks. And I be tell you, I was the first person who'd say, oh, I know that story. She was tired, long day at work, feet right. hurt, just decided she didn't want to move. That is just absolutely wrong. This is a who was a, as much a fan of, of Dr. King as she was of Malcolm X and the Black mm-hmm. Panthers. And mm-hmm. I think for a lot of people, they can't kind of hold those thoughts in their heads. Right. Right. But, but she could. She was about justice for Black people and whatever it took to get there. And I, I love the this documentary because, again, this is American history. This isn't just for black girls to know this, which obviously is great that they're going to, there's not going to be a whole new generation of black girls growing up knowing the real power, the real power of Rosa Parks. But I think what's really important is to have an honest conversation about who some of our freedom fighters were in America. And she is clearly in the pantheon, but not for the reasons that so many people sort of put her on the soft pedestal. It's like, oh, no, no, no. She was, she was a warrior in the fight for racial and, and uh, uh, economic justice. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I'm always curious. So why? Why make her out to be this almost passive, you know, just happenstance, right? If it had been a different day, if she had been less tired, she wouldn't have done it. And, you know, and you just realize that that is um, it's an unfair take on her legacy, which was always about standing up. I mean, as you said, right, she would travel into the deep south and take notes on the women, particularly who were victims of, of rapes because she felt like the the truth of their story mattered, even when someone like Reese Taylor, a black woman had been raped mm-hmm. by, by three white men and told if she ever testified, if she told anybody, they'd kill her. You know, both of them sitting there, Reese giving her testimony, uh, Rosa Parks writing it down, traveling into Alabama to write it down. And, and yet, literally both of them knowing there's no justice coming for Reese right. Taylor today, tomorrow, in the next year. You know, but knowing that, the facts of the case matter. It matters. I mean, I, I just I think it makes them both more mm-hmm. heroic mm-hmm. and more uh, courageous and more um, intentional. And also, I, I like the idea of working towards civil rights is not a just one day you just accidentally yeah. stumble upon it. But actually, right. it's a lifelong, decades long, constant grind of working toward justice. Mm-hmm. It was never easy. It was never accidental. It was never stumbled upon. Right. And the real dedication. I am so appreciative of you and your team putting this together for all of us uh, to to view and digest and really appreciate uh, the hard work, the the long journey that we've gone through for civil rights. And, you know, sadly, the, the journey that we're still on in an active a very active way. Um, okay, so we're going to return with the Blackest Question, and I'm here talking with Soledad O'Brien, my guest this week. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black fashions, Black mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. We are back. Soledad, are you ready? So ready, born ready. Oh, I love that. Okay, (laughs) question number four. Now, this church was located in St. James, New York, and Mm -hmm. was a stop on the Underground Railroad for fugitive enslaved folks uh, who were en route to freedom to Canada. What was the name, what, what is the name of this church? Wow, so this is where I grew up, St. James, New Mm -hmm. York. That's it has right. to be an Episcopalian church. It's not a Catholic church, I don't think, because I think I would have heard about it. I'm Catholic. So St. Philip, St. James was my church, but I'm going to guess it's an Episcopalian church in St. James. Am I wrong? It is St. James AME Zion Church. Where so the built heck is that? in 1833, St. James AME Zion, which stands for African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, is believed to be the oldest church structure in Ithaca. St. James AME Zion was visited by both Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, and the congregation there was so outspoken about anti-slavery that many enslaved persons who had planned to flee to Canada decided to stay and settle in Ithaca. 
Oh, so it's Ithaca, not St. James, New York, where I grew up. I grew up in St. James, New York, but that's St. Okay. James, New York, Ithaca. St. James, New York, Ithaca. So have you ever visited this particular church? No, never. I'd never heard of it. Okay. And so, you know, when I think about the Underground Railroad and obviously so many of, you know, our ancestors trying to, to make it northward, um, it reminds me of, I, I think, linking back to the documentary that you were just talking about, how we don't really have an accurate narrative of what has actually happened in this country. And I think, you know, it's, it's very neat and there's Harriet Tubman and, you know, sort of she's sort of helped people make it, you know, to freedom. And then we sort of put a, a little bow on it and then we move on and that was then and this is now. And so part of what I feel you do, especially on Twitter, but obviously in your other projects, is making sure we have a certain level of accuracy and specificity that that shouldn't be sort of glossed over or forgotten. How can we really, Soledad, beyond, you know, beyond Twitter, really make sure that we like harness in the truth, I guess, the truth of what has happened in this country and the truth of what is happening in this country. How do we make it a lot more concrete so we can link what happened, you know, with people trying to escape uh, US chattel slavery and, and fight for their freedom? and then fight through the civil rights movement with sort of the explosion that we're seeing today of people who actually really want those days to return. I saw something on Twitter the other day, which was a little graphic. And it basically showed that five years before Rosa Parks sat on the bus, Harriet Tubman was freeing the slaves. So I was like, Five years? Just five years before? <laughs> like that mm -hmm. graphic is, and then it was a mess, right? And you realize like that made no sense at all. But if anybody looking at it would really think these were all events that were mm -hmm. a bunch of other events too. None of the timelines were accurate. And, and so I, I think I like to think of people like Ida B. Wells, right? Who even in the face of someone saying, well, we don't think counting lynchings is important. We don't think tracking them is important. We don't think the number matters. We don't think you know, really put her life and her work on the line day in and day out to to constantly talk about it and bring attention to it. I, I think it's hard to ignore people who say, no, nope, these are the facts. I'm not going away. You can't brush me aside. Mm -hmm. It is because of Ida B. Wells and all the work that she did on lynching that now you have people who today, I mean, all these years later, really track and have memorials around places where people were lynched, where their lives mattered. And not only those individuals' lives mattered, but like this was the history of this community here on this day. Let's not rewrite the narrative. So I do think, you know, the key is to call out just complete ridiculousness. No, there were not five years between Rosa Parks sitting on the bus and Harriet Tubman freeing the slaves. I mean, it's laughable, but I think right. some people see the graphic and might think it's true. And that the truth matters. I just think it's really important, even when I'm sort of tired, to just say, like, this is a lie. This is a lie. And right. I get very frustrated when journalists don't call out a lie or are used by others to, you know, to propagate lies. A good example would be in the testimony uh, from the young woman. I think Casey Hutchinson was testifying. And basically, some reporters were saying that they had sources within the Secret Service who were going to testify that what she was saying was a lie. Well, they didn't have, I mean, they had sources who were telling them that they, they were not sources that would testify, right? So at the end of the day, the reporters use their platforms to say, this young woman is lying when in fact, you know, she was testifying and these other people never materialized. And so you, you constantly see con consistently, maybe is a better way to put it, see reporters being used in a way for their mm -hmm. platform, um, being used to frame stories, being used to give credence to things that are just not true, not accurate. And, you know, again, I think anonymous sources is a good example, like why the anonymity. Um, right. Certain people should not be given anonymity, especially when you know that they are are lying. Uh, certain people should not be allowed on the air when you know that they are lying. So I think Ida B. Wells is a very good model of like, sometimes you got to keep shouting and screaming the truth just because it's the truth. And, and you may not, in the time that you're alive or the time that you're working, get the credit that you deserve for telling the right. truth. In fact, you probably won't. But we sow the seeds nonetheless. Got to do it. Got to do right. it. Okay. Um, all right, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back with our last question. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here. Everything you've been waiting for. Black culture amplified. Find your voice on the Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Griot Mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. 
So I'm back. I'm here with Soledad O'Brien playing the Blackest Questions. And Soledad, are you ready for question number five? I am, but I really feel like this should be called Very Difficult History Questions. (laughs) Well, I mean, I know our listeners are learning a ton, and I know they really appreciate hearing how you uh, conceptualize journalism in this particular moment, because it's it's more, it's it's now more important than ever, uh, I would argue, as we sort of fight for the soul of this nation uh, Mm. in the 21st century. Okay, question number five. We're going to switch gears just a little bit. Uh, I know you did some work on a documentary about the murders of Christopher Wallace, a.k.a. Biggie Smalls, a.k.a. Chrissy Greer's favorite rapper of all time, and Tupac Shakur. So let's see if you get this one. So as we all know, the two rappers started out as friends, but all that changed when Tupac was shot five times outside a recording studio in New York City while Biggie was upstairs. Both men were there to work on a project together with a third rapper. Who was the third rapper? Oh, this should be multiple choice. I don't remember. Who was the third the, rapper? The third rapper was Little Sean. Oh, yes. So Little Sean's a native of, was a native of East Flatbush, Brooklyn, and is the veteran MC who signed uh, to Uptown Records in 1995, just before the Tupac shooting happened. Little Sean now goes by the name Sean Penn, and he recently spoke about the infamous shooting, saying it's been a plague on his life that's followed him for nearly 30 years. When Suge Knight got him out of jail, it's the first time you heard Biggie and Puff did it. Mm -hmm. That whole East Coast, West Coast was manufactured by Suge. Suge did that. Sean is adamant that he, Biggie, nor Puffy had any knowledge that Tupac would be robbed and shot that night in New York City. But Tupac always believed Biggie and Puffy had something to do with it. And so both men released songs about the incident and the deadly East Coast, West Coast rap rivalry was born. And some music journalists have called their beef the biggest rivalry in music history. So uh, what were you surprised to learn when you worked on the documentary Who Shot Biggie and Tupac? You know, I think it was so interesting when we were shooting that documentary. um, And how did that come about? (laughs) It came about because, that's a good question. I remember how that came about. But someone asked me if I wanted to do it, and I was very interested. Partly because I I like diving into history, especially Mm -hmm. things that I don't necessarily know. I mean, I couldn't have told you anything about East Coast versus West Coast rivalry. But a, a friend, a very good friend of mine in college was the guy who created The Source magazine. Mm. And so we had a chance to interview him in that documentary. Really are on a journey to learn information from the people who were there. The music made him big, but what made him bigger is the war between those two. Me being somebody who's in the hip hop culture, friends with both of the people, you would think I would know. I didn't know a lot of stuff that I've heard. Um, But I, I think, the degree to which um, so much was based right on this rumor and innuendo and who thought they saw who doing what. And the number of people who had, I think, kind of credible versions of what happened both the night that Tupac was killed was uh, killed, and also, uh, you know, certainly a big deal. So I, you know, I just, I thought it was just so interesting. I, a lot of times people's stories hadn't really been pulled together of, on mm-hmm. in a documentary. So I was interested in that. And then of course I got to work with Ice T, who's amazing. I mean, that guy, right? Brilliant. Phenomenal. So smart, so interesting. The only I mean, and super like hardworking and just a total professional. Only thing that slowed us down, there would be so many fans at every corner. <laughs> like we have to stop shooting so he could say hi to the fans. Uh, but oh, it was just had such he's had such a career for so many decades in in quite a few genres. Right? Yeah. Not a lot of people do that successfully. And Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's a really interesting guy. So I I really enjoyed working with him. And I liked, um, you know, sometimes I would go in and talk to gang members or cops, you know, and just ask them like, I'll just be the person who, I don't don't know what the code word is for a gun. I don't know what the code word is for for drugs. I don't know what the code word is for prison. I'll just ask the dumb question. Um, And and I I really, I thought it was a very, very good doc. It was a really, Mm -hmm. it was a really fun experience. Well, and I think it was a great doc because it's it's about two individuals uh, that so many people, especially in the African-American community, loved deeply. uh, And should have worked it out should have worked and, it out like there was yeah, almost and, no reason i think in a lot of ways for the rivalry was so over the top and you almost get the sense that it just could have been brought down and didn't right. have to happen 
and we lost two brilliant right? minds uh, to say nothing of lyricists, but just brilliant minds right. uh, in, in sort of such a short span of time. Okay, so we're going to take uh, our, our last brief break and we're going to come back and play Black Lightning. Witty, honest, entertaining. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the Black culture debates you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. Okay, I'm back. We're here with Soledad O'Brien. And Soledad, before we let you out of here, we've got time for the Black Lightning Round. Are you ready? Now, this is a time for our listeners, and they know, I'm just going to ask you questions. You tell me the first thing that comes to mind, and we go from there. There's no right or wrong answer. This is just about Soledad. Yeah. If you had to choose, New York City pizza or hot dog? No, pizza. Which would you rather? Hot dogs, no. (laughs) What's in a hot dog? (laughs) <laughs> I know, what is in a hot dog? Um, there's a great Simpsons episode about that. Um, so which would you rather watch, morning news or primetime news? Mm, I love morning news. I like to get my day started with morning news. Okay. Are you cold weather or warm weather? Ugh, I hate cold weather. I live in Florida in the winter. Warm weather, 100%. Would you rather ride horses or watch your kids ride horses? Oh, that's a tough one. Probably ride horses. <laughs> okay. Movie night. Are you watching a rom-com or a drama? Always a rom-com. Nothing serious, please. I'm begging. Are you jamming to Tupac or Biggie? Uh, Neither. Luther Vandross. Sorry. (laughs) When you sleep, ceiling fan on or off? (sighs) Depends. If it's really hot on, I get very cold. So if it's not that hot, on, but with three comforters. Okay. Last question. Do you watch any trash TV? Yes. You know what I like? Um, Below Deck. Is that terrible? Because my daughter oh. likes it. That is a okay. peanut below deck. I haven't checked it out, but oh, I know the show. You will lose all respect for me when you watch it. You're going to be like, wow, you know what? We should kill this interview because I've lost all respect for Soledad. It is takes place on a, a bo- boat. Okay. Well, you know, uh, I have the TV young habits of a four-year-old where I just yeah. watch the same show over and over again, and I'm totally fine. I do okay. like Criminal Minds. That's a good show too. Oh, that's a great show. Okay. So quick reminder before I let you out here about the Rosa Parks documentary, give us the proper name again. Where can people watch it? And what do you hope the audience takes away and learns from this documentary? The doc is called The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. I hope the audience takes away the true story of Rosa Parks, a story that everybody thinks they know. Uh, they actually don't know at all. And it starts streaming on Peacock on October 19th. So I hope you'll check it out. Oh, I cannot wait. I want to thank Soledad O'Brien for being an amazing guest on The Blackest Questions. And I want to thank you all for listening to The Blackest Questions. This show is produced by Sasha Armstrong, Jeffrey Trudeau, and Regina Griffin is our managing editor of podcasts. If you like what you heard, subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And please download the Grio app and listen and watch many more great shows. Thanks so much. You are now listening to the Grio's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Don't forget, you can listen to the Griot's Writing Black podcast hosted by me, Maisha Kai. This isn't your typical writing podcast. We interview any and everybody that has anything to do with writing, from comics to poets to authors to journalists to politicians and more. Remember, that's Writing Black every Sunday right here on the Griot's Black Podcast Network. Download the Griot's app to listen to Writing Black wherever you are.